bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, uh, an Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be talking about the COACH approach, supporting families and children with disabilities. Before we do that, I did want to mention the uh, CAFC annual conference. Uh, you may have just uh, received an email, hopefully, if you if you have signed up for our email uh, notifications, as, we, as you just saw in our opening there, you do have the opportunity to sign up for our email newsletters and notifications. We did just send out information related to uh, our annual conference and the fact that registration is now open. So uh, hopefully we'll see everyone in October, uh, the 21st to the 23rd in Edmonton, uh, join us for our annual conference uh, and a great opportunity to network with child and youth health leaders from across the country. So hopefully we'll see lots of you there. Uh, so on with the presentation. Uh, today's presentation is one of many within our CAFC Presents series that are brought to you by, in partnership uh, with our colleagues at Childbright. Uh, through, a, through a knowledge translation partnership we've developed with them. Uh, Childbright uh, the, or the Childbright Network is an innovative pan-Canadian network that aims to improve life outcomes for children with brain-based developmental disorders and their families. Uh, they use child and family focused approaches. Uh, they work to create novel interventions to optimize development, promote health outcomes and deliver responsive and supportive services and lots more information you can find on the Childbright website at uh, I believe it's child-bright.ca. Uh, they've got lots of great research projects and resources going on, so uh, certainly go to their website for more information about uh, Childbright. Uh, so as I mentioned, today we're talking about the coach approach, and, and as you saw on our website, uh, the, the information that, that went out, a, a coach or navigator approach is a new model that is now increasingly being used in pediatric healthcare contexts, and our, uh, our presenters, our panel of four presenters, are going to talk about uh, uh, you know, a number of aspects of that. So let's uh, introduce uh, our panel today. Uh, first, uh, I'll introduce Tatiana Ogurtseva, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics and working with Childbright's strategy for patient-oriented research. Uh, by training, Tatia is an occupational therapist with several years of experience at McGill University Health Centre in Montreal. Also from Montreal, we have Dr. Annette Manimer, who's an occupational therapist uh, with doctoral training in the neurosciences. She's a professor at uh, the School of uh, Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill with cross appointments in the departments of neurology and neurosurgery and pediatrics. And she's also the vice dean uh, for education for the faculty of Medi medicine at McGill University. And she's also one of the leaders of the Childbright Network. Uh, we also have, joining us from Toronto, we have Dr. I.L. Cohen, who is a pediatrician at the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, where he co-founded the Complex Care Program in the Division of uh, Pediatric Medicine. He's also an associate scientist in the Research Institute at uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. He's an associate professor at the pediat of pediatrics at the University of Toronto, and, with the, and he's also with the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. And he's also a scientist with CanChild, uh, the CanChild Center for Childhood Disability at McMaster University. And last but of course not least, we have Dr. Maureen O'Donnell joining us from Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, and Maureen is the Executive Director of Child Health BC. Uh, she's also a pediatrician with a subspecialty in developmental pediatrics pediatrics, and uh, Dr. O'Donnell is also well known to many throughout the CAFC community for her involvement uh, in many aspects of our organization throughout the years, and including currently, she's our vice chair for our uh, board of, for CAFC's board of directors. So it's my pleasure to welcome all four of our, our panelists today. Uh, and we, 
before we move on, we are going to run a couple of polls. Our panelists did want to know a little bit more about our audience. So we just wanted to know what your backgrounds are before we get started. Uh, just just, just check, check off which of the following best describes you. I know some of you may uh, play many roles, including being both a physician perhaps and a parent, but pick the one that best suits you, the reason that you're joining the presentation today. So are you a physician, a nurse, child development or rehab specialist, a parent or other? Um, and that'll help us uh, better understand who, who it is that's in the audience. We'll just give everyone just another second to uh, to make a selection. All right, we'll close that off. And it looks like the vast majority are child development specialists uh, or rehab specialists and uh, OTs, PTs, uh, speech language uh, specialists at 58%, followed by other. Uh, and I'm sure many of those other are uh, researchers or others uh, in the research community interested in child bright. Uh, 9% are identify as a nurse, 5% identify as parents, and 1% as physicians. All right, and next, uh, we just wanted to know quickly if you've heard of Child Bright before. So just yes or no, have you ever heard of the Child Bright uh, Network? Uh, well, good thing people are joining this webinar because we've got 62% have said no, they haven't heard of Child Bright, but obviously interested in the content. So as I mentioned earlier, child-bright.ca is their website, and uh, you can certainly learn lots more information uh, about uh, Child Bright there. Uh, so as I mentioned, we do have four presenters. They're going to take us through a nice uh, sort of uh, breakdown of what the coach approach is all about. They're going to be talking about uh, what is a coach, why the interest now. They're going to talk about, then our next presenter is going to talk about what is the evidence on the coaching model. Uh, our third presenter is going to talk about key take-home messages for clinicians, families, and policymakers. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with uh, a, a little bit of a presentation on building new evidence at Childbright. So what are the new and exciting things they're doing there at Childbright? So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium first off over to Dr. Ma Maureen O'Donnell to introduce uh, what is a coach and why are we interested in this now? So over to you, Dr. Ma Maureen O'Donnell. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. So um, I'm going to start us off by talking a little bit about what we mean uh, when we're talking about a coach. And I think it's really important for us in the child health field and, and in the child development and rehab field to kind of get clear on some of this terminology, because even amongst ourselves, it's taken a while for us to, to make sure we're all talking about the same things. And we all hear these words, navigator, care coordinator, key worker, coach. Um, but being clear on what we really mean is, is really important. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So I'm going to start off by talking a bit about navigators. So this is a word that we've probably all heard, and we may even have a navigator that we've worked with or in our organization. But in the literature, um, it's really described that a navigator is somebody who has fundamental understanding of the system and can really help to figure out whether or not patients, in our cases, um, kids uh, who have rehabilitation or child development or rehabilitation needs, um, are eligible for specific services. Um, they're usually really clear on what the criteria are to get in those services, and they'll collaborate within or across organizations to help families get access to services and really help to break down the barriers. One of the things in the literature about navigators is that they may be somebody who works for an organization and helps make connections for families who are coming into that organization. They may have only one or intermittent contact with the family, um, but not necessarily an ongoing relationship with that family. Next slide, uh, which brings us to the second term that we might be familiar with, which is care coordinator. And sort of similar to the navigator, that person might have uh, contact with the family and help them get um, access to services and coordinate services across agency lines. But like you see in this um, definition by Bruder, um, which is an older one, um, they also have this added responsibility of having to, helping to coordinate some of the assessments and evaluation and participating in the development and review of service plans, um, then monitoring how well the delivery of the services are actually going, helping families to advocate for services, and then when it's time for families to move on, helping them to actually develop a plan about how they're going to move on to the next service or transition to a, a different community, for example. So their role goes beyond that of the navigator to having more of this sort of ongoing relationship um, uh, with the family. Next slide. And this um, table, um, I apologize for it being slightly blurry. You just want to concentrate on the left side of the table here. And this is from the Agency for Health uh, Research and Quality. 
really talks about some of the components of care coordination that that care coordinator might take on. So they're going to help to name some of the essential tasks to assess the patient, um, develop a care plan, identify who might might be involved in the care and specify roles, have a major communication uh, function, help to execute against that care plan that they've helped to create with together with the family and then monitor and adjust the care and evaluate the outcome. So that's just another way of saying a lot of those tasks that was in that previous definition. But you can see that kind of maybe different than a navigator, they're gonna have more of an ongoing role with the family and an ongoing relationship with the care team. So what about this word key worker? And I know this is a word that we were using in British Columbia back even in, in 2000, in the early 2000s. And um, Canchild has written some papers about the word key worker. And a key worker really came out of the work of Patricia Sloper in the UK. And um, they are a named person, <laughs> that's actually the official language in their definition, um, who the family can approach for advice or practical help. And um, they have a role that's very similar to that of the care coordinator. But interestingly, in the definition, they overtly talk about their main goal is empowering parents. Um, uh, by providing them with support and resources and information. So, you know, I think in many ways, a key worker is very much like a care coordinator, but maybe just a bit of added attention to this role of empowering, which I think is probably implicit in the role of many coordinators as care coordinators as well. The thing about the key worker literature is that they have uh, published a fair bit about it. And on the left half of this slide, you see that key workers can come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, and they actually receive training in the actual role. But this little table here just gives you an example that really it's, you know, we might have a preconceived notion that often these roles are filled by um, social workers or by nurses, but in fact, they can be filled by many different kinds of providers, but those people need to be trained in how to take on that key worker or care coordination role. And then on the right-hand side here, um, you see that there have been studies that have been done about the role of key workers and their effect. And um, in terms of the effect, there is evidence that key workers can improve the relationships um, between providers and families, and that families reported that they felt less isolated, less of a burden, and had more access to information and fewer unmet needs. There was a study done by um, Beecham and Sloper looking at the costs of key workers, and they really came to the conclusion that they couldn't really um, determine whether it um, cost more money or save money because of the challenges and actually costing developmental services, which I think many of us are sure familiar with. So that brings us to this word coach. Um, and I think the reason that we've spent some time talking about these other definitions is because we really wanted to, um, to, to make sure we were differentiating what the difference was between these roles before we talked about coaches. So what does coach mean? So um, the coaching in child development and rehab literature is growing. And there's definitely uh, reported examples where interventions are delivered uh, to children or children through coaching. And the parents or caregivers are coached to deliver an intervention that's very aware of, of the context of the child and their development and then their home and then they're in their, you know, they're, they're setting in their real life. Um, but the coaching itself is delivered in the presence of the child and is directed at the child. And there are growing examples of this, particularly in the literature related to child development, uh, child, child uh, beha developmental behavioral conditions like autism spectrum disorders, ASD. And it's been called in the literature occupation-based coaching, which is means that an, an intervention, um, it's an intervention that combines the principles of coaching and occupation-centered reasoning. So for example, the reasoning that an occupational therapist would use or a physiotherapist would use that focuses on, and this is the quote, increasing positive care, child caregiver interactions and child learning opportunities in everyday routines and contexts. And that's from quite a recent paper and was focused primarily on children with autism spectrum disorders. Um, uh, Iona Novak, who many of us from the physical disability um, world know, um, talked in her paper about coaching, about solutions-focused coaching techniques, which are very similar. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is in one of the references from um, Iona's paper, and it talks about how, if you just look at the picture here, um, on the left, starting at the left side of the diagram, um, the therapist in the context of their organization 
come together with the child in the context of their family and community. They then develop a relationship. Um, they think in using that vision of a preferred future and together they create some goals. They create a strategy of how they're going to uh, reach those goals. There's some training and support that's provided. They, they plan and confirm how they're going to carry forward. And then they take action and have the cycle of continuing to improve, kind of like a continuous quality improvement cycle. But as you can see, it's, um, it's about the child um, and it really is bringing together that therapist's skills in, uh, together with the parent's knowledge of the child um, to train and support the, the parent in delivering some therapeutic intervention that will enhance and support the child's development at home. So that's, that's sort of how we've thought most of the child development rehab literature um, has focused on coaching. But there's another kind of coach that's in the health literature as well. Um, and, you know, I guess you're probably not surprised at this point that there, while there's not one universally uh, accepted definition of coaching, health coaching has been described as a goal-oriented, client-centered partnership that's health-focused and occurs through a process of uh, client enlightenment and empowerment. And this health coaching um, uh, characteristics are a little bit different than the ones that I just talked about where it's very child-focused. In this case, it's really about um, empowering. So empowering a person to take ownership over their health, making sure that the providers are focusing on what that person's goals are uh, rather than what the professional might want to achieve, about building a supportive and collaborative relationship by having an underlying assumption that the, the person who is being coached is resourceful and has terrific potential without any help from anyone else, um, helping that person to assess where they are um, and what they'd like to achieve, helping them achieve those goals in easy steps that really are doable, and um, helping them to um, change habits or beliefs that if those are in fact things that might be barriers to them and making a, a positive change. So it's very much focused on not delivering um, an intervention, but in empowering people to um, to have more um, ownership over their health and health status. So that approach is quite different than that very child-focused approach. And so this health coaching literature is, is really a growing area. And if you search this topic, you'll see that there's um, a huge amount of literature that is developing. Um, however, there hasn't been a lot in this kind of coaching related to um, parents of children with disabilities or children with disabilities. And so um, that was really what brought us to thinking, well, why is that? And we also recognized that we had significant challenges in thinking about how to support families who are waiting for services. And I think all of us who are serving kids across the country know that, and certainly parents know, that often it can be very challenging to get access to services, whether they be diagnostic services or assessment services. And so through our Child Bright Network, we really wanted to examine whether we could support um, families while they were waiting for services by providing them with some coaching um, because that we thought might empower them um, if we could do a good job, um, but also would help them to really um, be able to, to have better um, ability to move forward themselves as, as well as support their child while they're waiting um, on what unfortunately can be long wait lists. So that really got us thinking about, about, um, about this, this potential. But we wanted to start by really understanding um, what evidence there was for such a model. And so I'm gonna hand it now to Tatiana, who's gonna tell us a bit about what evidence there is about the effect of these coaching models. Tatiana? Yes, hello everyone. So I'm very happy to present to you the findings of a review that we conducted to determine the level of evidence on the coaching model. So again, just to put you in the context of the situation, there are two different coaching approaches. The first one that is the more traditional one where the parents are being coached, trained or educated in the presence of their child with developmental disability on different parent skills, remedial or compensatory strategies in the face of their child's disability. There is another approach that has more recently emerged, which consists of coaching the parents remotely or in the absence of their child, which of course also represents a much more feasible, more accessible and possibly more cost-effective way as it can be delivered at a distance, online 
over the phone as self-directed learning individually or in groups. So this later model is being increasingly implemented and used in the last two decades and advocated for as the best alternative to the more traditional approach. Nevertheless, when we build and we recommend best practice guidelines and we promote any type of intervention strategy, it is important to first conduct a preliminary assessment of the actual effectiveness of that particular treatment and the level of evidence behind it. As such, we asked ourselves the following research questions for the review. So among parents of children with developmental disabilities, how effective is a health coaching program versus no intervention or versus a comparison treatment in improving parent-related outcomes? So I would like to also acknowledge here that there's a body of evidence on parental coaching benefits on child-related outcomes. But in today's webinar, the purpose will be to focus on its effects or lack of thereof on the parent outcomes. And also, I would like to facilitate your understanding using this concept map right here where you have the two approaches, so where the coaching is happening in presence of the child versus where the coaching is happening in absence of the child. And this is where you are right here. This is the review that we're doing. And then we're also uh, focusing on the parent-related outcomes right here. So to quickly take you through the methodology, we conducted a systematic literature review that consisted of a comprehensive librarian-guided literature search, initially yielding nearly 1,300 citations. This was followed by transparent study selection and data extraction, and of course, individual included studies quality ratings, and synthesis of sufficiently similar data as per the population of interest. In our case, it will be the different diagnosis of the child as well as the type and the nature or the focus of the health coaching intervention and then the nature of the outcome. So we included intervention studies that were randomized clinical trials or RCTs and also non-randomized clinical trials that studied a health coaching intervention treatment for parents of children with developmental disability in the absence of the child and contained at least one parent-related outcome. As a result, 11 RCTs and uh, 18 non-randomized clinical trials were selected. Those were published in the past 18 years. Most of the included randomized clinical trials were of high quality, followed by fewer studies that were of fair and low quality. And most of the non-RCTs were of low quality, followed by fewer that were of fair quality. In terms of the country of publication, while a handful were conducted and published in Asia, UK, and Africa, the majority were either performed in the United States of America or in Australia. And interestingly, note that none of the found studies were conducted in Canada, so there's a lot of room for growth here. Now, let's take a look at the participants in those studies. Uh, those included parents with a sample size ranging anywhere from 28 to 122 participants. Not to a surprise that 87 to 100 percent of the samples were mothers, and those were mothers mostly of children with autism spectrum disorder, followed by much fewer studies that uh, included parents of children with cerebral palsy, and also some studies that included children uh, with a mixture of diagnosis, so for example, physical disability as well as autism spectrum disorder or uh, intellectual delay. And on average, those children were aged a year and a half to nine years old. Now, how was the coaching provided? The majority of the treatments were delivered individually, followed by fewer studies that provided the coaching in groups. And then also a few studies combined this uh, individual and group learning format. Mostly face-to-face -face type of delivery methods were employed, followed by the most recent studies that used on online self-directed or at a distance learning, and also some studies that combined this face-to-face -face with online or at a distance coaching intervention. Nearly 80% uh, of studies used informal education and support in their coaching uh, program, whereas 14% were manualized and delivered online, and 10% of the projects combined those education sessions to parents with self-directed manualized online learning. Uh, who was the coach? Uh, in 80% of the studies, uh, this was an accredited healthcare professional that was trained to provide the coaching intervention. In 15% of the studies, those were graduate students in psychology, rehab science, or nursing. And in one of the studies that I found very interesting, mothers were actually trained 
mothers of children with developmental disabilities were trained to be coaches and provided the coaching intervention, intervention to other mothers of children with developmental disability. So now we were also able to classify, most importantly, the studies are as per the nature or the focus of the coaching intervention that was provided. As a result, we have those three categories that you see on the bottoms of the slide. We have the first category that we called the child-directed evidence-based approach. So this is where the parents are being coached and I would repeat, in the absence of their child, but however, they're coached on parenting, uh, parent skills and treatment strategies that are directed to the child with the focus on the child. And there are nearly 70% of studies that did that. So a lot of projects that focused uh, only on the child. The second category is called the parent-directed psychoeducation. So this is different because the focus is now mainly on the parent and his or her self-management or stress management abilities, techniques to self-control to improve their mood and their affect, to manage personal conflicts and to advocate for self and for their child. And also some of the studies, 13% mixed uh, those uh, two approaches together. So now uh, I'm going to come back to this concept map and show you that uh, we're looking at this approach, so where the coaching is happening in the absence of the child, and now we have those three different focuses. So when the focus is only on the child, and we're looking at the parent-related outcomes, when studies combine uh, the parent-targeted and the child-targeted approach, and this third focus where the approach is mainly on the parent. And I would repeat that most of the studies use this child-directed, um, targeted approach. So now I think the next question um, you all want to know, so what is the actual evidence? And uh, uh, let's take a look at this. We identified nearly 20 different parent-related outcomes that included anxiety, depression, coping mechanisms, the knowledge gain, the self-efficacy, stress levels, sleep quality, overall mental health, the presence and coping with marital conflicts, health-related quality of life, and problem-solving abilities. However, as shown by the numbers below, nearly 60%, so a big chunk of those outcomes, are defined by either insufficient evidence, which is level 5, or in other words, poor to low-quality non-randomized clinical trials, or limited evidence, which is level 2A and 2B, so in other words, low to fair quality RCTs. Now, if we zoom into the outcomes that were defined by level one evidence, so this is what we're really, really looking for when building evidence-based guidelines, or in other words, those are high-quality RCTs, they represent only 33% of all the outcomes that are reported. And 30% um, of those RCTs found that the health coaching model was more effective in most cases versus no treatment, in improving outcomes such as parental depression, marital conflict, self-efficacy, and stress levels. On the other hand, we have 70% of those high-quality randomized clinical trials that found that the health coaching intervention was as effective um, most, uh, in most cases in comparison to another treatment or usual care in improving parental-related outcomes. So this is quite an interesting result because here we see uh, that 30% uh, of the studies, when compared to no treatment, so for example, this is very representative of what the families in need are currently going through when they're awaiting to be treated. So they're receiving no treatment, and the health coaching intervention was shown to be more effective. So we are uh, doing something good here. On the other hand, given that 70% of uh, those RCTs found that they uh, health coaching intervention was as effective in comparison to usual care or to this more traditional health coaching intervention, we need to um, look uh, at how we can improve this health coaching intervention to be even more superior at this. So now um, I think the next question you all want to get answers to is what are the key ingredients to a su successful and effective health coaching program? So what did the studies do to find a positive and a superior effectiveness? So first of all, they did include uh, a component on this parent-directed psychoeducation that was comprised of problem-solving, goal-setting, and action-oriented with uh, and feedback sessions, where parents would learn very specific self-management and empowering techniques. Following this one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching type, individual telephone boosters with the coach were provided to recap this information and all the learned material and also to share the experiences. 
And even when the learning was self-administered, for example, when uh, parents had to go through online learning modules and this was delivered uh, online, those telephone boosters were also present in those studies. So this one-on-one -on -one coaching um, recap with the coach was um, present. Another element to think about is the duration and the frequency of the programs. So we did found a big discrepancy across the studies that are currently available. However, uh, one of the things that we noticed is that a higher frequency and a longer duration of coaching is more effective than low frequency, for example, when the intervention is provided in one session over three months or an intervention that is of short duration, for example, four sessions that are only provided within seven weeks. So this is something uh, also to think about. And uh, on this, I will pass on the word to Dr. Annette Maimer. Thanks, Tatiana. Before uh, reviewing some of the key take-home messages, why don't we uh, first get a sense of the current landscape in terms of the use of these different types of models of uh, coach, navigator, care coordinator. So I'm asking you to pull, uh, Doug, uh, for those working in the healthcare setting, um, whether or not uh, they use a navigator in their institution. So remember the navigator is someone who is very familiar with the healthcare system and helps with navigation across different sectors um, and helps the families in terms of what services are needed and if they're eligible. All right, so just like we did at the beginning, just make your selection on the screen and we'll uh, see what the audience thinks about what, or has to say about whether or not they're using a navigator at their institution. It looks like it's almost split. 44% yes, they do use a, a navigator. 42% no, 9% planning on it soon, and only 5% saying they're not sure it's possible. Okay, so it seems like something that's getting out there. What about a care coordinator? So remember, this is a single point of contact. So it's a person that coordinates all services and advocates on behalf of the patient and family. So for this one, 56% saying yes, they do use a care coordinator or a key worker, 29% saying no, 11% saying planning on it soon, and 4% saying not sure it's possible. Okay, so this seems to be um, more popular. It'd be interesting to know a little bit more about um, in which context. Um, so that could be brought up in the discussion. Okay, so the third poll is relating to uh, using a coach in your institution. So remember, this is a formal coaching of a parent um, by an individual with a real focus on promoting either child health, so that's child-directed, and or parent health, so being parent-directed in terms of focus. And it looks like 50% saying no, they do not use a coach, 41% saying yes, they do, 6% planning on it soon, and 2% not sure if it's possible. So it's interesting that we're seeing 40 to 50% uptake of these different types of models of support for families. Um, it would really be interesting to hear more about it through the a discussion period. So the last, uh, well, we have one more question, oh, two more questions. So if you are using coaching in your institution, which statement is, uh, best represents the content of the coaching? Is it predominantly focused on child-directed, um, so really about how to promote the child's development and uh, give, give the parents strategies about their child's development? Is it more about uh, parent focus in terms of parent education and empowerment um, to help with parent outcomes? or is it a combination? All right, so we'll share the results there. It looks like 52% saying their coaching combines child-directed and parent psychoeducation methods, 40% saying their coaching is focused on child-directed evidence-based approaches, and only 8% saying primar primarily focused on the parent's psychoeducation and empowerment. Okay, um, and finally, we were curious to know which uh, population um, was receiving the coaching approach. Um, so which one would best represent uh, the population in terms of parents of children with different disabilities? And for those of you who might be selecting the other option, feel free to put in the comments box who, who, what, what population that is that you're using for, and I can 
uh, bring some of those to the uh, to the presenter's attention as well. If you're using something other than the choices of autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy or physical disability, or glo global develop developmental delay, if you are selecting other, please feel free to to type that other into the uh, into the question box. And that's also my chance to remind the audience that. Uh, 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 you do have the opportunity to, to ask questions of our presenters, of our what will be our four presenters. We'll be hearing from Dr. Al Cohen shortly. Uh, but if you do have any questions, post them in. And we did, uh, someone did choose other, and they did indicate all. Um, so we possibly could have made these, uh, the, this one a, a select all that apply. I, I did make it just to select one of the following, but that probably uh, was bad question design. I probably should have give, given people the choice to, to choose all of those. And some of the other, some of the other others are children with any speech or language difficulty. People are suggesting, uh, but most of them that are saying the other are, are just suggesting that they they use they do apply this to multiple patient populations. So. Okay. So um, so just to go to some key take home messages um, for uh, frontline providers. And this is with respect to coaching a parent without the child. So what we see is there overall is a high, a high that high level evidence is lacking, but the evidence that we have suggests that there is some promising effectiveness for the child directed approach to coaching. In other words, where you're helping to support families um, in giving them some strategies for treatment, for behavior management, for changing environment in ways that can improve the child's development. And these studies have mostly focused on children with autism spectrum disorder. There is less evidence available currently on coaching parents of children with physical disabilities or other developmental disabilities, and less evidence on a more psychoeducation approach where you're really focusing on parent outcomes more specifically. So we definitely need more evidence in this respect in terms of promoting the health and well-being of parents of children with developmental disabilities. If you were to develop a coaching program for parents, you have to really think about which approach is most relevant to you in terms of what you want. Is it with the child there or not? Which type of content uh, is most relevant for, and what is your goals? What outcomes are you most interested in? So what, for what purpose? Um, it's, what we do see from the evidence is that the content is important, particularly those that are really thought through in advance, that are predetermined, manualized, and really are directing to what parents need. So really engaging parents in discussions about what content would be most relevant to them. And also looking at the delivery methods and using multiple delivery methods that may, be, that may include face-to-face, -face, online, on telephone, or web-based that has opportunities uh, for parent-to-parent, -parent, uh, like our group uh, interactions. And it seems that that combination um, is best in, because it's most engaging and helps to reinforce different content. Dosing seems to be important too, although we don't have enough evidence as to what the right dose is, but longer, more frequent seems to be important. Um, so if you're going to set up a coaching intervention, at this point, um, we have to be cautious because we don't have a lot of evidence. So it's important to really set very clear goals about what the purpose is and make sure to, to select outcome measures that align with your goal. For families, um, this type of approach can be very helpful in terms of supporting both child and parent-directed content for families. In particular, it can fill some gaps um, in terms of educating families about their child's health condition and what to expect, about service delivery aspects, you know, what, to, what, uh, what the lingo is and what the different options will be so that they're more informed and more prepared for different um, assessments and interventions, and to provide uh, support to families to build their uh, resilience and empowerment. And it's also an opportunity potentially to connect families uh, with similar, similar needs. In terms of policymakers, the evidence to date would suggest that child-directed coaching therapies can empower families and improve outcomes. 
um, by giving uh, parents more knowledge, greater empowerment and resilience, and greater support. Um, so it is looking to be a promising approach, although we definitely need more evidence to support these types of interventions. So uh, we need to uh, stay tuned for evidence, and we will be uh, presenting to you some of the work in, uh, uh, that's in progress in the Child Rights Network. In terms of research, this is a growing area of need in terms of knowledge gaps, particularly since there are many children now being uh, diagnosed with different disabilities, and there are many intervention options out there and a very long wait list, as Maureen had described. So we need evidence to determine what the added value of parent coaching models can be, particularly um, looking at two different outcomes, the child's outcome and the parent outcomes. I just want to let you know that we are preparing uh, manuscripts. Um, there will be a commentary um, that we're working on, defining the different terms as Maureen presented, and uh, Tatiana's just finalizing her systematic review on parent coaching. So uh, look, please look out for these papers if you're interested. So I'd like to now um, introduce Eyal, who will tell you a little bit about Child Bright and some of the studies on coaching. Thanks, Annette. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Child Bright, Child Bright uh, is an acronym that stands for Child Health Initiatives Limiting Disability, Brain Research Improving Growth and Health Trajectories. And it's a large uh, uh, team-based network uh, that is part of CIHR's uh, SPORE um, strategy, which is a strategy to improve patient-oriented uh, research. So increase engagement with parents and children when it comes to pediatrics or patients, uh, and when you're speaking about broader populations, uh, in the way we conduct research, in the, in the topics we choose for research, and how we partner with patients along the whole uh, pathway of, of research. And Childbright was uh, one of the sport networks um, that got funded a couple of years ago uh, with, within this framework, and particularly uh, one with a framework that, that focused on, on, on chronic conditions. Next slide, please. So the vision of the Childbright network is to achieve <clears throat> brighter futures for children with developmental disabilities and their families across the life course by promoting healthy outcomes, through optimizing brain development, creating novel interventions, and providing responsive and supportive services. Next slide. And the target populations uh, for the work of the network are infants, children, and youth with chronic lifelong brain-based developmental disabilities. And this could be a wide variety of diagnoses, uh, which could include uh, diag known diagnoses of brain-based disability. So things like autism, cerebral palsy, an intellectual disability, uh, um, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, et cetera. Uh, or it could be um, children and youth who haven't been necessarily diagnosed with a brain-based disability, but are at substantial risk of a brain-based disability. So this uh, gets at uh, populations like uh, infants who were born uh, preterm or very low birth weight, uh, or, or those born with congenital heart defects or with uh, perinatal asphyxia. And a second major target of the Child Bright Network is also on their families. Uh, and uh, and that's, a, that's a key piece and particularly relevant to the topic uh, that we're discussing today vis-a-vis uh, -vis coaching. So the, there are three uh, major themes uh, within Child Bright. And the idea of Child Bright is really to, uh, to, to help uh, promote the development and testing of effective interventions with an aim that each of the that, that these groups of interventions will improve uh, uh, the child's brain plasticity and subsequently improve uh, developmental trajectories for children. The second aim uh, is one specifically focused on the mental health and well-being of children and families. And the third one, which I'm going to spend the most time talking about today, is one that's focused on the experience of children and their families uh, within the Canadian healthcare and developmental services uh, systems. Next slide, please. So that third theme that I alluded to, we, 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 have, we, have, we have coined the term Bright Futures to, to help describe it because it's really focused on improving uh, the future via uh, a redesign of the way uh, service delivery is, is organized. And, and one that's much more patient oriented than the standards are, uh, across Canada. 
I'm going to speak a very, very briefly about three separate projects. But before I do, I just wanted to highlight in that second theme that I mentioned before around uh, mental health, there actually is another coaching project built into that called Strongest Families, which focuses on coaching uh, for, 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 uh, uh, for children uh, and their families uh, when, in cases where children have emotional and behavioral difficulties. So there is a fourth coaching project that I'm not going to spend uh, uh, any time talking about, but but just uh, just to reinf reinforce the point that coaching is a huge piece of a lot of these interventions that are being tested and de developed and tested within Childbright. So within this third theme, the one focused on on system redesign, um, they they all focus on coaching with with slightly different flavors, both in the way that they're delivered and in the target populations. And this will align uh, a lot with, the, with what was discussed before in the systematic review. But the key piece of, these, uh, of, why, of why these were picked as the projects was that they focus on the key uh, stages of transitions across the life cycle for children and youth. Uh, the first one being uh, that, uh, that highly vulnerable time when newborns uh, who have uh, complications uh, in early life, like uh, prematurity, congenital heart disease, uh, or hypoxic injuries to their brain, um, are transitioning from a medical environment within an NICU into the community. Uh, and that has uh, been well described as a highly, highly vulnerable uh, point in time, particularly for their families uh, and, their, and their caregivers who look after them. The second transition point is another uh, very vulnerable transition point is a transition from uh, preschool to school. And the third transition point that uh, these projects will focus on uh, is one that, that focuses on uh, the transition from youth-based services to adult-based services and the, and the psychological transitions that occur uh, during that period of time uh, uh, for youth. So the first transition, the neonatal transition, the project uh, that um, uh, is being conducted is called uh, Coach Coordinated Enhanced Neonatal Transition, or CSENT. And again, it focuses on high-risk neonates and parental caregivers. And here the coaching intervention really is, it's, it's difficult to coach a, a newborn. Um, so the coaching intervention really here is solely focused on the parents themselves uh, and involves care coordination, um, uh, coaching using um, uh, uh, a framework uh, called uh, mindfulness-based uh, uh, approach uh, in combination with some anticipatory guidance, education, and support. And this project, as are all the three I'm going to describe, is being designed as a randomized control trial where the, where the, where the uh, control is a standard of care, which is standard neonatal follow-up where newborns are seen for, um, for screening uh, uh, in large part. Um, and the outcome, uh, the primary outcome for this particular trial is decreased parental stress, as well as a, a number of other um, uh, outcomes related to the health and well-being of both the parents and the child. Um, and this project is uh, being run out of a number of centers across Canada in Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, and uh, Montreal. The second project, uh, which is uh, being led by two of our presenters today, uh, Maureen and Annette, is one uh, focused on um, a developmental code system to help empower families of preschoolers with suspected developmental delays. And again, this is getting at that transition period um, in the preschool period toward uh, moving towards the school age uh, period. So the target population here are parents of preschoolers two and a half to four years of age with suspected developmental delays who are basically in the system awaiting assessment, treatment, or services. And again, the intervention here is, is coach fit focused and uh, focus primarily on the parents, uh, involving health coaching, online educational tools and peer support. The comparison again is to usual care. And the outcome here is one of empowerment. The primary outcome that's measured in, 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 this, in this trial is empowerment, as well as a number of other secondary measures, including uh, family stress, parental cells, sense of well-being, and, and parental sense of competence, as well as cost to the healthcare uh, system. And this study as well is being conducted across Canada and Quebec, BC, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia. And the last project is a little bit different uh, than the other two. It focuses more on an e-health intervention as opposed to a, 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 a human coach. Um, so this, uh, this project is titled Ready or Not, uh, Readiness in Youth for Transition out of Pediatric Care. 
And um, again, the focus here is on transition of, of youth, 16 to 18 years of age, with a brain-based disability. Um, and, and, and the intervention here is, a, the, is an innovative e-health uh, prototype. So this project is in multiple phases. And the first phase is the development of this, um, of this e-health prototype, and then experimentally implementing it uh, uh, to, to eventually see how it works uh, in, in the real world using uh, multi-site RCT. And again, this is being run across multiple centers in Quebec and Ontario um, to, to provide some generalized knowledge uh, from this project. So in brief, to recap what we've, uh, um, what, what we've discussed in today's webinar, uh, we started off by talking a little bit around different terminologies and the importance of clarity in terminology uh, with a specific focus on coaching, uh, and um, and the contemporary interest in, in in coaching now, both in the in the in the community of practice uh, as well as in the research community. Um, you heard a little bit about the uh, evidence from a systematic review on coaching uh, in children and youth. Um, we spoke to you a little bit about uh, key take-home messages uh, that can be relevant based on the evidence known to to date for clinicians, families, and policymakers and gave you a little bit of taste of some of the work that's being done in the Child Bright Network to build uh, new models and new evidence for coaching um, uh, in, in, in children and youth at risk of uh, brain-based disabilities. So I'm gonna pass over to Doug uh, in, 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 a, in a second, but just to highlight a, a few other um, uh, of the summer learning series that are coming up. Uh, on July 5th, um, there's a session on exploring some of the barriers, drivers, and benefits of public participation in research. This is all, again, very much related to the key themes in Child Bright of, um, of, of improved uh, engagement of patients and families in the research process. The second one on July 26th on uh, how is patient engagement incorporated into a research project. And the third one on August 9th on patient engagement in um, in action, a case study in patient-oriented research. And uh, the website there uh, will uh, uh, is, is available for, for signing up and uh, lots of other options on social media for being a part of the Child Bright Network. Thank you. So I was just, uh, we're happy to answer some questions, but we just want to make sure uh, to encourage people to complete the survey that you will all receive at the end of the presentation for feedback um, as we develop uh, other presentations in the future. All right, and I did just uh, put a link to that survey in the uh, in the chat box. So for anyone in the audience who uh, you will receive it in the email that follows that the follow up email that you'll receive from this uh, this webinar. But if you did want to click on it today and go and fill out that survey, uh, that will really help uh, our Child Bright colleagues sort of improve and evaluate their their ongoing research in this area. So so please do uh, do go ahead and do that. So as I said, it's now time to take some questions from uh, our audience. I did want to call. Uh, uh, you know, a do-over on that question related to where, which populations are using for uh, coaching for. So just while we're uh, uh, going through the, the, the questions, uh, not to interrupt the question period, I'll just give everyone a chance to redo that question. And this time you do have the option to select uh, all that apply. So just to let us know which patient populations, if you are using coaching, uh, which population are you using this for? So while you're clicking your answers for that, uh, we'll get into the questions. The first question that came in was from Cindy. She's asking about uh, during, um, uh, uh, I think it was during Dr. Cohen's uh, portion of the presentation, you were talking about sort of the research, uh, you know, the, some of the research synthesis and that sort of thing. She was, she says they've used the health change approach for coaching families, and she was wondering if that methodology uh, came up during any of your uh, your literature searches or or your syntheses of research. So maybe I'll pass that to Tatiana because she's the one who did the literature uh, review. Most of the studies uh, that were included really just focused on health coaching. So health coaching either. Uh, that was directed towards the parents or towards the child or towards both? I'm not aware from the, there are many conceptual approaches to uh, uh, to change. Um, and, um, you know, we, I, I don't think we spoke about this in great detail, but there are many theoretical frameworks for coaching. Um, I'm not aware within these three projects whether uh, we use the health change approach in them. Um, in the the ones I'm most familiar with, we didn't, but we used uh, we used other ones. And I I think I think it's an excellent question because um, even beyond uh, the kind of 
what is a coach is it, it's really it, it, I, I think it's really important to to think a little bit around the theoretical framework uh, behind what, what what coaches are actually doing. And along that say the next question was probably similar. Um, they're asking about the pivotal response training or PRT being researched as a more effective therapy therapy for ASD population. Was that would that is is that one that you specifically looked at as well or? Um, so this one, uh, we, we haven't came across in the literature uh, of this one because I think maybe it included more of the navigator uh, type of, of a role. So perhaps those studies were not included uh, in the review because we focused mainly on health coaching. So the studies that were selected had to contain some form of uh, health coaching element and not only a navigator uh, type of uh, element. Does this answer the question? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure it doesn't. If if any of these answers don't answer your question, please do uh, don't hesitate to put a follow up question into the question box, and and we'll come back to it. But uh, um, uh, the, as a follow up to the health change, and, and the health change is capitalized all in words, so I'm assuming that's referring to a, a formal program with the title Health Change. Um, Cindy's saying Health Change does have a lot of research support, primarily from research in Australia, but believes most of the research is not with uh, families or, with, or, or children. So um, so anyway, it's just uh, an opportunity to uh, to consider, as, as Dr. Cohen said, lots of different frameworks out there related to, to coaching, and certainly not all of them were studied. But uh, uh, please don't, don't hesitate to ask us about any other frameworks if you are using those, and perhaps uh, they were one of the ones that were considered or looked at in the, in the research. But. Doug, maybe I'll just jump in here as well. I know I know that some of the um, health coaching approaches, you know, the uh, that I talked about, it's more in in my section, and I think in some of the background of some of the literature that we found in the systematic review that Tatiana did, for sure that idea of um, sort of the stages of change and um, you know moving from the pre-contemplative stage stage through contemplation preparation to ultimately action those are absolutely underpinnings of many of those coach approaches so i think a lot of that literature that cindy i think it's cindy has is referring to has been used in the development of the, the health coaching uh, models as part of the theoretical underpinnings so i think there's i think i think your point is really well made cindy and in terms of the um, the autism training, I think a lot of the literature that that speaker was talking about is would fall into that category that um, Tatiana described of being what we've called child directed, meaning the primary focus is on the parent um, working together with their child to support their child's development. And so, because of the we have been a little bit more focused um, as. Um, Al pointed out on in our project on the focus on the parents. Um, we have done less exploration of that particular um, literature, but you're absolutely right that there is a growing literature around that particular group. And I know that there are um, at least two research studies, as well as rollouts of that um, that um, um, therapy and or a coach coach therapy approach. Um, and there's a study here going on in British Columbia that's called the PACE study, funded by the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. And then um, similarly, I know there's some autism related work, although I don't know if it's specifically related to the therapy approach that you've talked about um, in your question going on in Montreal. Hope that helps. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is just asking, and uh, we did have, and I'll put up the results from that survey just so you can see it. It does look like most of the people are using, if they're using coaching, they're using it across the spectrum of, of uh, conditions that you did uh, uh, suggest. But the next, one of the questions that came in from the audience was about using coaching with DCD or a developmental coordination disorder. Uh, it, was that, uh, is that one that you are familiar or are aware of that, that it's being used with? Uh, the studies that were selected for the review, the ones that had uh, the mix of mix of diagnosis, there were very very few children that had any type of physical uh, impairment in comparison to the number of children that had more behavioral, like uh, autism spectrum disorder. So this definitely this uh, area of research is not developed enough with other population than autism spectrum disorder. So there's a lot of room for uh, for further projects in order for us to be able to generalize those uh, health coaching interventions to other population. 
The next question is coming in from Kelly, and she's asking about frequency and duration, as they seem to be important for effective change and intervention. Did the literature review reveal an optimal timing for these interventions? Yes, that's a very good question, and that that is why we also said that if you are designing uh, and planning on designing a coaching intervention, that you have to do it with caution and perhaps wait for more evidence because the, there is a quite of a range in the frequency and the duration across the studies. And, um, of course, the ones that were on a longer period of time, for example, provided for uh, 18 months, and they had a session two times a month for 18 months. This was proven to be, of course, more effective than something that was provided for about four to six weeks. But in terms of uh, the most optimal one, um, I would say that for now uh, we need more trials in order to determine what will be the optimal frequency and the optimal duration. Uh, it's a trial and error uh, type, of, um, type of research at this point. Doug, I'll just, chime, I'll just chime in there as well. And Annette, I don't know if you want to add something, but the, um, uh, you know, I think in terms of because there isn't clarity in, in you know, an absolute rule around the dosing and the frequency, one of the things we've done for our um, randomized trial is ask families. Um, and families have thankfully been very involved uh, as true partners in our research study. And so they've been helpful in guiding us about what they think the, the frequency is. So I think you know, in developing a formal coaching program, which of course goes beyond, you know, sort of taking a coaching attitude with a family who might be with you in the clinic, but actually developing a formal coaching program around that particular topic. I think engaging with families around the specifics of the program you're developing at this time um, would be really helpful. Um, the, the next question is asking about uh, what she's referring to as Hannon's research related to parent training, facilitation, and coaching. The Hannon Center in Toronto is what she's referring to, and it pertains to speech, language, and communication development of children. Are you familiar with how that research, research or work from that center uh, is related to the, the research that you guys are doing in this area? Um, it didn't seem to come up when we did the um, systematic review because we were focusing only on parent together with coach without the child, and probably that literature is more together with the child. But using different um, keywords relating co to coach and limiting it just to when the without the child present, it didn't come up in that uh, in the review. All right. I think I think the I think the other thing on that one is um, because the in the Hannon um, approach, as uh, you know, as many know, the um, it definitely is the support of the parent who then um, helps to support their child in their language development. And um, I think part of the reason that that might not have come up is because the Hannon approach has been around for a long time. And I, I suspect maybe the keywords coach don't actually um, come up, you know, maybe in the actual literature searching. It might be in the documents, but perhaps it doesn't come up in literature searching. So that's a good tip. We should actually go back and have a look at that. Thank you for that tip. All right. Well, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, and uh, we are just a few minutes over time, and there's just a couple more questions I think we'll try to get through before we wrap up. Uh, the next question is asking if you're familiar with any formal training that exists in the physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language, physician, nurse training, in the like at the university level. Do any of these programs have coaching training of any kind embedded in their curriculum? I don't, I'm not familiar with actual formal training as part of the professional training, but there are now, like, as these, uh, as different research develop and test different coaching models, they are all developing training programs as part of their intervention um, to, uh, to enable, uh, you know, more uh, to standardize the approach and also to think in terms of uptake and use down the road if, it, if these interventions end up being uh, very successful. So for example, we, are, we all have training manuals and uh, training activities for the coaches uh, for our interventions. And uh, similarly with the Strongest Families uh, intervention, they also have a very, you know, a very uh, it's manualized and have, there is a training program. So I think uh, the, you know, as we design and test different in coaching interventions, it's really critical that the training is part of it's the intervention itself to ensure that um, if people take up and use some of these approaches, um, it's not enough to have a manual, but to also have the training. 
All right. And the last question before we hand it uh, over, maybe we'll hand it over to you, Annette, for any sort of cl closing comments you'd like to make. Um, but the last question was just, and I, I think it came in when Dr. Cohen was uh, was presenting his uh, uh, section on the research. Uh, they're, they're asking, what are the common tools that are referenced in the studies as outcome measures related to uh, coaching? Like how, how do you measure an, an, an appropriate outcome associated with successful coaching? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, I, we have done a lot of work within the network to try to uh, look across all our projects, not even just the coaching projects or other projects in the network that I, we didn't describe today, to try to have some sort of standardization of what we're measuring. Um, it, but but I, I think to even take a step back and have a conceptual framework of what the target is um, it helps a lot. So so as we spoke today, there's a, there's a big difference between coaching targeted at a child alone versus coaching targeted at a parent alone versus a, a combination of the two. So coming up with with uh, with 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 uh, with outcomes really needs to map to. Uh, to, to that that particular target, and then across those things, what we've done as a network is, um, you know, if we're measuring stress and uh, is, is trying to figure out a way that everyone's measuring stress in kind of the same way with the most with a with the most valid I instrument possible, um, and and I think that in and of itself is really important because there's so much variability in the kind of tools people are using uh, to to measure success um, uh, in, in these kind of studies that. That having a little more um, a, a little more standardization of, of measurement outcomes will, will will go a long way to to help move this field forward. Excellent and, question. Yeah. Uh, also, in our um, project um, that's looking at preschool to school age, when when families are just learning about the developmental concerns of their child, um, we were interested to look at their readiness for coaching because coaching isn't necessarily for everybody. So we did find a tool uh, in the literature and modified it to make it appropriate for our population. And we'll be interested to see how that uh, relates to the outcomes of interest in terms of the parent empowerment and other parent-related measures. All right. And with that, we managed to successfully get through all the questions. So I think this is a great time to wrap it up since we are a few minutes over time. And I'll just hand it over to you, uh, Annette, just any or any of the other panelists, if you if you have anything important you'd like to leave the audience with, but just for some closing key messages you'd like to leave the audience with or, or any suggestions as to where people might find more information about any of this work or how to get more involved with Childbright in general. So I, I would really be interested to learn more from individuals about what, uh, what they're doing currently, what their challenges are. We're very interested in, in pursuing that conversation offline or just to hear from you about uh, your own experiences as we delve into this new area of research. Um, I would encourage you all to join Childbright so you can learn about other webinars and uh, knowledge translation activities that we have. Um, to, uh, that relate to children with uh, developmental disabilities and their families. And uh, I really appreciate all the interest in this area. So thanks very much. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Doug, for the opportunity to do this uh, with CAPSI. Oh, it's certainly our pleasure. Thank you again to, to Child Bright and all of today's pre presenters, uh, Dr. Maureen O'Donnell, Dr. Ayal Cohen, Dr. Tatiana Ogurtseva, and Dr. Annette Manimer uh, for all of your work. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's always great work that comes out of Child Bright. So it's always our pleasure to bring uh, your work to our audience. All right, and with that, we will close this off. So thanks again to the audience for joining us. And of course, as I mentioned to our presenters, we typically do our, our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, but today actually represents the end of our, uh, our season uh, as we break for our summer hiatus. So this was in fact our last presentation until September. Uh, but as always, sign up for our email newsletter, which you can find on our website. Uh, that way you uh, will certainly get the email when the next webinars are scheduled. Uh, in the coming webinar season, uh, CAFC has uh, looked at a, a, a re reduced rejuvenating our, our, uh, our strategic directions around certain content areas, which will be uh, featured uh, will be featured in, and, and highlighted in our upcoming webinars for the coming season starting in September. So hopefully we'll see everyone back in a couple months, and I, we hope you have a great summer. So bye, everyone. <laughs>